dear students so in this lecture we'll continue from where we left in last time talking about the applications of environmental microbiology and we went into bioremediation so i started talking about bioremediation and we we understood that bioremediation is not just degradation of contaminants by microbes but it also includes other avenues of bioremediation wherever we find my uh, solutions the remedies to our problems environmental problems using biological uh, agents microbes that is bioremediation so we started with uh, the one of the problems that we face today is that we are running out of our metals so we um, the quality of our ore that is left is not very good we are already past production of our important metals such as copper gold and silver so we need to now be able to extract metals from poor quality ores like really bad quality ores the ones that were rejected earlier and still make profit out of it and um, have affordable metals um, available for market so for in this case we use microbes to encourage metal leaching on the other hand then we started talking about asset mine drainage problem where because of mining the mine which is usually reduced the ore gets exposed to oxygen gets oxidized the sulfide in it gets oxidized to sulfate which reduces the ph when the ph gets reduced you have lot of metals leaching out in the water now you have acidic water and water laden with metals usually heavy metals not good for anybody present in the surface water and the ground water flowing and then i asked you um, how can we remediate this and i offered that one of the ways in which people have remediated is that they have set up columns that are sulfate reducing columns so they are rich in biomass and they have the right conditions for microbes that reduce sulfate to grow in them and once we have the sulfate reduction happening the sulfate in the water will turn back to sulfide then the sulfide will react with the metal make metal precipitate the ph will increase and the metal dissolution will go down anyway so the water that will re, uh, leave the reactor leave the column that is reducing the sulfate will be um, higher in ph compared to the acidic water and will have less amount of metals so this is one of the ways in which the microbiological approach has helped remediate the acid mine drainage problem and um, some r really fascinating and impressive work in this field was done by dr amy pruden when she was in colorado state university and um, today we'll be talking about the tools that she used and the tools that we can use now to um, monitor the remediation progress and how can we apply the environmental microbiological techniques that you have learned so far to solve a problem like acid mine drainage so let's start from there so in the previous class um, we talked about bioremediation briefly and what is bioremediation these are the processes that use microbes to return the environment the altered environment back to original condition or to help uh, us find problems uh, solutions to our problems and when we are using bioremediation to degrade contaminants there are two ways we can go about it we can bio augment we can bio stimulate in bio augment what we do is we isolate strains or we study some strains that are very good at removing a contaminant from environment and once we have enriched them in the lab and we have tested their efficiency we put them in the environment and we allow them to degrade um there are limitations with bio augmentation in one of the previous lectures i have shown you a cartoon of this a wonderful beautiful pseudomonas putida going out in the real world and realizing that degrading hydrocarbon in lab is very different from degrading it in environment so this is what usually happens with bio augmentation in certain cases it works really well especially when we are talking about perchlorate remediation in bio stimulation we create conditions suitable for microbes to remediate the problem to get rid of the contaminant so if uh, we want more sulfate reduction to happen we'll add biomass or we'll add the nutrients so that sulfate reducing microbes can be enriched so bio stimulation involves addition of so in at bio stimulation we don't add microbes we we'll let electron donors we we'll add nutrients we we'll add surfactants and i'll talk about why why and when surfactants are important and helpful we add electron acceptors electron donors or anything other or any other chemical that will help accelerate the remedial process so the chief difference between bio augmentation and bio stimulation is that in bio augmentation we add microbes we are augmenting the existing microbial community in bio stimulation we are just stimulating the existing microbial community either ways we are trying to get rid of the contaminant 
Okay, in the previous class, I talked about acid mine drainage, why it's a problem. As, and as I mentioned in the introduction, this, there was a solution offered by Dr. Amy Pruden when she was working in Colorado State University. So here she is sampling one of the acid mine drainage problem. Very, uh, she's a pioneer in environmental microbiology. I, if you're interested in take, doing research further in environmental microbiology, and it's a quite quite a uh, promising field, by the way, I highly encourage you to follow her research. She's um, current global leader in uh, environmental and public health. So in Colorado state there was a big problem with acid mine drainage. So the water pH was very low and very rich in heavy metals and usually it would work this way. These are the mine tailings. So this is the rejected stuff from the mines or this is just where the mine is happening and then this is the flow. This is your aquifer. This is the flow of ground water. The contaminated water flows and it destroys the vegetation, destroys the ecosystem. What she offered was let us add a reactive barrier. So wherever um, uh, in the permeable reactive zone, she created this permeable reactive zone. So it's permeable, it allows the water to go. It's a reactive zone in sense that there is a reaction happening and these are the reactions happening. So the two important things that are happening in this is that um, the sulphate is getting reduced to sulphide and the metal sulphate is getting, metal that is dissolved in the water is getting precipitated as metal sulphide. So metal is getting precipitated as metal sulphide and sulphate is getting reduced as sulphide. What she has added here is lot of um, electron donors and these electron donors will uh, encourage, once oxygen has depleted in this react, uh, column, they will encourage the microbes to eat a uh, uh, reduced sulphate and this, this becomes a sulphate reducing zone. So the water that comes out from here from the other end of the permeable reactive zone is the remediated water. It's good in pH, normal in pH and does not have heavy metals, lot of heavy metals and the vegetation is saved. So this was her very highly celebrated work that and she did some really cool research on this and developed some microbial techniques for us to be able to analyze the remediation process. And as a result she showed that the concentration of heavy metals in um, remediated environment was very low. So what you are seeing here in blue is the influent, the concentration of zinc in the influent is pretty high. and if if we just add, if we do nothing and just put a reactive barrier here, so in some places she put reactive barrier, in some places she put reactive barrier but she added cow manure, cow dung. Now cow manure or cow dung is very rich in um, microbes, so biomass and it is very rich in electron donors but it is lignocellulosic material so it is not, um, it does not degrade readily but it does degrade over time. So she put cow dung and she noticed that not adding anything and adding cow dung did not have much significant difference. In certain, after certain days, the cow dung um, added PRZs showed some reduction in zinc, but overall there was not much difference. And then in some, she added acclimated inoculum. So these are sulfate reducing microbes that have been acclimated to the severe conditions of the acid mine water. So usually cow dung should work really well. Cow dung is very rich in microbes, very rich in electron donors should be able to deplete oxygen very rapidly, should be able to switch to sulphate reduction very rapidly. But remember the water that is coming here is very rich in metals and many microbes are susceptible to metals and they cannot survive in metals are rich in water. And many microbes that live in cow dung cannot live in such acidic water. So when they are exposed to acidic water they die, there is no point of carrying out sulphate reduction anymore. So in the lab what she had done was she had acclimated some of the inoculum to the uh, low pH and heavy metals. So in uh, acclimation mm. is a very interesting term and we will talk about it in, uh, we just talk about it uh, in a bit. And uh, I briefly I can tell you acclimation is um, giving conditions to the microbes so that they can get adjusted to the new environment. So we expose them to the new environment and once they have been exposed they are used to it. So now these microbes in the PRZ they were exposed to low pH high metal concentration water in lab and then the microbial community had selected for microbes that are uh, can thrive in low pH and high heavy metal laden waters and can carry out sulfate reduction. So th the microbes that were acclimated they showed the most consistent and definitely look at the values are dropping from high of 20 all the way to near 1, 2 milligram per liter of zinc. So they caused the most consistent and the highest amount of uh, dropping in the levels of heavy metal in the water. So this, these were the column experiments that she first did in the lab 
and then eventually went out in the field and did experiments. Now, if you were given this problem, and this is a problem in many parts of the country, how would you go about treating acid mine drainage? Well, now we know that this is an established approach. So, what we can do is we can take our cow dung, we can take our uh, electron donors, our biomass that are cheaply available in India, readily and cheaply available in India, and then we can acclimate them to the particular acid mine water that uh, from the mine that we are talking about. So, if the mine is rich in not in zinc, but let us say in iron or copper or something else or whatever heavy metals are or uranium, we can expose these cow dung to these metals in and in the pH that they will have in an environment in the lab. Once they have acclimated and they can carry out sulphate reduction in presence of low pH metal laden water, then we can inoculate them in the lab in the field. And okay, you have inoculated them in the field. Now, how do you know it is working? Well, obviously you need to have some way to measure the water before the reactive barrier and after the reactive barrier. So, you can see the drop in the metal concentration, you can see the increase in pH and you can know whether this water remediated water meets your quality standards or not. And if it does not meet your quality standards then you need to make some changes in your reactive barrier and if it meets your quality standards well and good. Now, um, the other thing is okay you know that there is remediation happening, but how much of this remediation is just adsorption of metal or chemical uh, driven reactions because the oxygen has been depleted but the microbes are dead but because the oxygen is depleted the sulfur dioxide sulfur sulfate is turning into sulfide chemically and the metals are precipitating chemically and once the chemical uh, onset happens we know that the reactive barrier is not going to last very long because the microbiological process are very important for it to be consistent so in order to track the microbiological process now uh, think about what are the tools that you can use to track if the microbes are still alive, if they are still thriving and what their community structure is, who are the best sulphate reducers because here you are doing biostimulation, but in other mind you can use these best sulphate reducers and then do bio augmentation. In US bio augmentation is illegal, mm, in India we are still in the experimental stage for example, right now we are using some microbial strains to sequester chromium from the groundwater in Ghaziabad. Alrighty, so how what tools would you use to uh, monitor your degradation and your microbial community in the reactive barrier before reactive barrier and after reactive barrier? So maybe pause the pause this video for a minute and think about it. And when you are ready, come back and listen to what I have to say about it. Alrighty, so now that you're back, I I hope that you have some ideas, some solution on how to um, track the microbial communities. A uh, typical uh, approach is first to understand how many microbes are thriving. So, if we notice that the number of microbes is going down, number of bacteria is going down, we know that our microbial community is diminishing, it is not doing very well and it might die out and then after some time the reactive barrier will be rendered useless. So, definitely you want to measure the number of 16S rRNA because 16S rRNA is a universal gene that will tell you the number of total bacteria present in your microbial community. So, the first approach that you should use is do quantitative polymerase chain reaction. QPCR and target 16S rRNA gene. So, what you can do is at different distances at right where the contaminated water meets the reactive barrier and then some distance from here and so on and so forth until remediated water and even beyond you should measure you should take samples again with depth also take samples and measure the number of 16S rRNA gene and um, that would be your total bacterial count. Now, you have done 16S rRNA gene now you know your total bacterial count what else can you do? Okay, using your QPCR, now you can target the genes that are specific to sulfate reduction because the major criteria for this, the major driver for this reaction is sulfate reduction. So, there are there is a particular genetic marker, it is called DSRA. So, you can use this genetic marker DSRA, this gene. Uh, which is specific for dissimilatory sulfate reductase A, which is an enzyme, it codes for that enzyme. And this enzyme is uh, crucial for reduction of sulfide to sulfide. So, not sulfate to sulfide, but sulfide to sulfide. And um, once you have one and once you have uh, detected the gene, you know that sulphate reduction all the way to sulfide is happening. Because not only are we interested in sulfate reduction to sulfur or to sulfite, but we are introduced we are interested in making hydrogen sulfide only when this is present the metal will precipitate re precipitate readily so you can do qpcr and tar targeting gene dsra and again at different depths so you know at which in this way you can also know 
uh, is this width sufficient for the reactive barrier or should it be more wide or is it too much we do not need to have such wide reactive barriers all this information you can get by tracking with width the um, reduction in DSRA in the gene that is specific to sulphate reduction what else can you do once sulphate has been exhausted methanogenesis can set in so you can look into MCRA MCRA gene is specific for methanogenesis okay what else can you do so these are uh, based on electron acceptors electron um, oxidative gradient now on the electron donor side you have uh, oxidation of biomass oxidation or biomass sorry oxidation of cow dung because it's cow manure in india also buffalo manure cow manure are very easy to find so uh, so in order to understand the oxidation of cow manure you can use um, markers that help you understand help you track degradation of complex carbohydrates and for example for aromatic carbohydrates you can target uh, uh, you can target the catechol uh, based proteins the enzymes that degrade catechol intermediate and then um, so when, when you track them with depth when you track them with width so both with depth and with width you can get an idea of the functional characteristics of microorganisms now coming back to the one of the questions that I mentioned earlier if I know what microbes are the best when it comes to sulfate reduction in this particular case next time I do not need to add cow manure I do not need to have such wide reactive barriers all I need to do is add those sulfate reducing microbes and they will take the care of the job or let us say this reactive uh, membrane this reactive barrier it stops working as well as it is doing right now what I can do is I can um, just add inject bio augment those excellent sulfate reducers resuscitate the sulfate reduction microbially driven sulfate reduction process in order to isolate them what I need to do is I need to take microbial samples I need to take them to lab and then I need to culture the microbes that are present there and then when I have cultured them I need to isolate them and I need to see how well they are doing at sulfate reduction the other way is that over time because the microbes that are better at sulfate reduction over time they will be enriched in the community so what you can do is you can collect samples from select sampling sites and over time and when you do that you can see how um, uh, over time the microbial community is changing so you can profile the microbial community and thankfully for you now we have fourth generation sequencing techniques third generation sequencing techniques so you can do a sequencing of the microbial community using ion torrent platform when the nanopore sequencing becomes more common and uh, popular in india you can use nanopore based sequencing or you can use the same old illumina sequencing which is very very useful or pyro sequencing which has very low error rate and sanger sequencing will be very expensive and tedious so, and less informative so don't go there so you can use these next, gen next generation sequencing techniques to sequence profile the microbial community and note how the structure of microbial community is changing over time under the assumption that over time the better sulfate reducers will be enriched as long as there is sulfate present. So you can use these the microbiological techniques in order to answer acid mine drainage problem in the country. Alrighty. So now let us go through some brief vocabulary and then move on to other environmental challenges. So biodegradation. Biodegradation is when microbes they degrade chemically degrade your pollutants. Mineralization when finally the microbes have degraded your contaminant to an extent that now you are producing minerals gases like carbon dioxide water. So they cannot be degraded further the most degraded version of um, pollutant possible. In transformation what we do is we transform the redox state or we transform um, to some other metabolite to some daughter product which is which has reduced toxicity or reduced mobility so if you talk about acid mine drainage we transform the uh, oxidized metals metal sulfides to metal sulfide which will precipitate which are more stable have lower mobility so in this case we are changing the redox state of the metal and converting it into a metabolite that has low mobility so this is biotransformation then you have another term called xenobiotic Xeno means unfamiliar. So any compound that is not very familiar to life is xenobiotic. Nowadays, uh, not nowadays, but in past few decades and definitely nowadays also, we use many chemicals in our day-to-day -day life that were not present on earth before 
um, mankind invented them and started producing them in labs and in industries. So these are contaminants that is entirely foreign in nature and thus less amenable to bioremediation. Now over millions of years the microbes in our environment have gotten used to certain compounds and certain contaminants and they are very nice in degrading them. For example, wherever there is an oil well and oil routinely seeps in, even before man started exploring oil and taking it out from the earth, the oil naturally would seep in. So, in, for example, in the deep vents in the oceans and the seas, then in those areas, the microbes in the vicinity of the oil seep would be quite used to degrading the contaminants over time, degrading the petroleum over time. And this is not a xenobiotic because in this region microbes are used to the presence of petroleum and they know how to degrade it and they are very good at it and they have evolved over many many generations to be used uh, suitable for living there. Xenobiotics because they are new on the face of earth the microbes are taken by surprise they do not know what to do with it. Many a times they are they die because the xenobiotic interferes with the life processes many times they just ignore it and move aside. Sometimes the xenobiotic resembles the um, resembles a compound that microbes are familiar with and they know how to degrade it and how to use it for food um, or energy and then or electron and then the microbes will actually um, degrade it try to degrade it similarly and if it works out well for them they will be able to degrade otherwise they will not be able to degrade. So this is the, uh, the challenge of xenobiotics. Now some important topics that we need to cover when we are talking about bioremediation we need to understand gene regulation. So we need to understand how the genes are regulated. So remember in the acid mine drainage I was giving you an example of quantitative polymerase chain reaction. You can do qPCR and find out whether the genes for sulfate reduction are present, for methanogenesis are present or not and that will give you an idea of functional characteristics. Now if a gene is present, I have mentioned this before, does not mean that it will eventually be transcribed into RNA. Even if RNA is present, does not mean it will be translated into protein. If protein is present, does not mean that protein is actually active protein. So, at each step there is regulation, we need to understand what things trigger gene regulation, what things trigger these regulatory processes. So we need to understand them in this study for bioremediation. We need to understand metabolism. Some contaminants serve very well as electron donors, some contaminants serve very well as electron acceptors. For example, the metal sulphate or the oxidized version of metals, they act as electron acceptors, right. On the other hand, petroleum, another contaminant will act as electron donor. So we need to understand where uh, and how in metabolism we also need to understand how the microbes will eventually degrade a contaminant, what are the different steps they will go in to go through it, will it be an assimilatory degradation or dissimilatory degradation. In assimilatory they actually assimilate that um, the daughter products of the degradation into their body, they use it for making biomass, in dissimilatory they only degrade it to get energy or electrons. Then metabolic control. Okay, they have everything in line for metabolism, but what is affecting, what is regulating their metabolism? Then we need to understand the both aerobic and anaerobic pathways of contaminant degradation and transformation. So um, same compound like hydrocarbon, when degrading aerobically, it will have different um, end products versus if it is being degraded anaerobically. So we need to understand both anaerobic and aerobic pathways of contaminant degradation or transformation. Then we will talk about enrichment cultures, why they are important in bioremediation, biodegradation and um, how do we use them and then we will talk about certain bioremediation techniques followed by molecular fingerprinting technique which um, nowadays have to be next generation uh, sequencing techniques. Now what are the contaminants of concern? We are very concerned about petroleum hydrocarbon. Not very long, long time ago there was a major oil spill near Chennai. In northeast India, many we have many oil wells, and many of them are routinely cause oil spills and are destroying the local environment there. It's just very unfortunate that this is not making news in our country. The number of oil spills, major or minor, that are happening in our country, different parts of the oil fields in our country, and are affecting the water, affecting the soil, and the local flora, fauna, and public health. So petroleum hydrocarbons we are very interested in. The other thing is some petroleum hydrocarbons depending on the well they are coming from, the age of the well and also the process, the, the refining or the processing of the petroleum hydrocarbon that has happened whether it is raw or refined, they might have certain components which are very very toxic. For example, aroma, if the petroleum hydrocarbons are rich in aromatic components from a particular well and it undergoes a spillage in the environment or it is exposed to the environment or the environment is exposed to the aromatic rich petroleum hydrocarbon. Now these aromatic components they are more soluble in water 
because they are aromatic and uh, they are electron rich they usually form very good ionic bonds and ionic bonds are usually more soluble in water. So, um, the aromatic compounds and they are also very toxic. So, not only will not only are they more toxic, but they are more likely to be present at a higher concentration in water. So, they will affect the aquatic life and human life more. Then we are very interested in pesticides in India. This is a major, major problem. Why is it a major problem? Because um, most of our Indian citizens are still involved in agriculture, which is the back actually agriculture is the backbone of our country and we need to help them help our farmers and agriculturists and one way we are trying to help them is by in giving them more and more freely available not freely but easily available pesticides so pesticides what they do is they kill the pests obviously now many of these pesticides are xenobiotics they are poisons because they kill eukaryotes for us also for environment also and for helpful insects also so in agriculture like in human body we have good insects we have bad insects Pesticide tries to wipe them all, thus disrupts the ecological balance in uh, natural ecosystems. Not only that, these pesticides are water soluble, so they flow through our surface water runoff, they seep into the groundwater and they form quite substantial, uh, they, they contaminate quite substantial uh, number of drinking water and water, surface water across the country. So pesticides and uh, uh, many of them are recalcitrant, so they are very hard to degrade. The other thing we are interested in is aromatic hydrocarbons. So, the components of petroleum hydrocarbon that I told you are aromatic and we are very interested in polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs because they are not just a benzene ring hydrocarbon, but they have multiple benzene rings. So, they are toxic, they tend to be slightly more soluble than other kinds of hydrocarbons such as aliphatic hydrocarbons and because they are polycyclic, they are highly stable, very recalcitrant they are not going to degrade easily. So, PHS degradation remains a major problem across the globe. We are very interested in solvents. So, we use solvents all our day. We like whether we are painting a car, painting a house, we use solvents and these solvents what happens to them? We just when they are, we are done using them, we just dump them on the ground or dump them in the dump yard. And when we do that, they infiltrate our ground water and then we have a major issue. Now again there are certain shops, certain industries that use more amount of solvent than a house, typical household would and they are the major sources of solvent contamination of groundwater. Then we have chlorinated compounds such as perchlorate, such as bleaching powder and mm, we use lot of chlorinated compounds and many of them are recalcitrant like perchlorate based compounds and when they infiltrate groundwater they create a big nuisance and they have to be treated. So these are again what we are very interested in. This, these are global problems. Pesticide is certainly a biggie in India. The other biggie in India is fertilizer. And some fertilizers are not a major issue because microbes uptake them, algae uses them, which becomes an issue if it's a lake. Trees take them, plants take them, but some fertilizers are not good for environment and they are recalcitrant as well. Then we have energetic compounds. These are very rich in energy, so they usually degrade very fast. We have inorganic constituents such as metals. And then we have pharmaceuticals and personal care products. In recent decades, pharmaceuticals and PCPs, personal care products, have emerged as a major source of problem. Why? Because the medical care is now more readily and easily available to India. For example, for most medicines in India, you don't even need a prescription from a registered doctor. Just go to a medical store, ask for pharma, uh, pharmaceuticals, ask for medicines, and they give you. Sometimes you don't even know what medicine you need to get, but you just ask the medical store person and he'll give you some medicine that he thinks is best for you. So they act like pseudo doctors. Um, the one of the major disadvantage of this is that um, the human beings, we have a tendency to eat medicines just because it makes us feel better thanks to placebo effect. So even though it's a headache and does not require antimicrobial, antibiotic, I'll definitely go and get an antibiotic from a store so that I can feel better thanks to placebo effect. Now, because of this, lot of antibiotics and antimicrobials and pharmaceuticals in general are being consumed by human beings. A registered doctor who is well trained will tell you, okay, use this medicine for 5 days, for 10 days or how much ever longer it takes. But when you have free access to pharmaceuticals, we self-drug ourselves, we self-administer the drugs. And in this way, we more, than, more often than not, we are abusing the drugs, misusing them or overusing them. And as a result, the concentration of pharmaceuticals in the environment increases a lot. Now, what do pharmaceuticals do? They kill microbes, 
they uh, kill um, they are toxic to many different life forms and they also affect the they create other problems they affect migrable communities in ways that hit back to us so in in short the pharmaceuticals are now a major major problem in our country and across the globe where because the levels of pharmaceuticals have increased and in the environment and not all uh, well pharmaceuticals are not very good if they are present in the environment for many reasons because some pharmaceuticals are endocrine disruptors so the hormonal therapies for example uh, we give steroidal um, pharmaceuticals to relieve allergies right and autoimmune diseases now in these cases steroids are very good for them but they are very bad for us the corticosteroids not the muscle building steroids so the, these corticosteroids are very bad for healthy people so if i have more of them in my drinking water and i'm drinking them regularly they'll affect my body's production of corticosteroids and that will affect my hormonal cycle and then we have uh, many uh, hormones that are actually administered as pharmaceuticals when their levels increase in environment they affect public health and most of these pharmaceuticals are soluble in water or to some degree and then they are dust transported through aquatic systems the other problem is when we have higher pharmaceuticals present in water or in environment microbes they are very clever they develop resistance to it so they develop uh, antimicrobial resistance so they are resistant to all known antimicrobials or some antimicrobials or few antimicrobials however it works or particular antimicrobial which is not good for us because when microbes stop dying because of uh, when they are exposed to antimicrobials sooner than later the pathogens in our body who are infecting us will also stop dying when we eat the medicines so pharmaceuticals are a major major contaminant of concern and personal care products big big issue and we'll be slightly talking more about personal care products than i have done in previous years because uh, now uh, again in the last few decades the consumption the consumerism in our country has increased a lot so now we have more people using fancier shampoos more often fancier soaps and um, more often again we don't use the um, herbal ones that um, that is just rita or uh, the natural root powder that allow us to clean our bodies without using the carbon rich um, soaps not only that not only the essentials now now essentials just soaps detergents but we are also using other personal care products things that we don't biologically need such as different kinds of makeups and creams and uh, products that have microplastic in them now this is a big nuisance because most of these pcps are again xenobiotics they are very rich carbon source so they are very good for microbes but many of them are recalcitrant or they have preservatives in them so they don't degrade very easily the other thing is many of these personal care products they have micro beads of plastic in them so you might have seen advertisements of toothpaste or you must have used those toothpaste that show some glitter inside them and they claim that this glitter will scrub your teeth and clean the teeth better so many a times these are microplastics and when these microplastics enter the environment because when you brush we spit the toothpaste out eventually um, it destroys the environment and they live very long in they are very hard to remove because they are so small in size and because they are plastic they are impos- nearly impossible to degrade in environment and they are big big nuisance environmental and public health from environmental and public health perspective so these are the various contaminants of concern currently and in the next few lectures we'll be talking more about them how to degrade them what are different studies that have happened what are different pathways we'll be looking a little bit more in detail about these important topics gene regulation metabolism metabolic control aerobic and anaerobic pathways enrichment culture the biotechnology where technologies we use for bioremediation and we have already talked about next generation sequencing so i'll be just touching briefly on when what is applicable so dear students this is all for today be tuned for the next lecture when we'll dive more deeply into these important topics of bioremediation thank you very much